It's time for another FAQ video. GQD support FAQ video number two. So the other week I put up a post in our forum on Facebook. If you're not a member, you should join it at facebook.com slash group slash GGD forum. Uh, we post little exclusive bits. You get questions, videos, um, you can sort of dictate what content you see, lots of good stuff. I posted a question in that group the other week saying, I'm going to do another FAQ video. I want questions from you. And I got quite a few, so we're going to do them. Okay. Number one from Michael with, with, from Michael withy, with hey, with hey, from Michael. How would you parallel compress a snare in Cubase with smash and grab? I know Nolly went over this in his mixing masterclass videos, but it'd be nice to see a bit more step-by-step -step detailing as well as maybe a bit more of an explanation as to why it's important. Sure. Okay. Oh, it's dried. Probably should have done this before I started the video. Okay, so let's talk about why you do parallel compression on drums. Um, drums by the nature of what they are, are very transient heavy. You can tune them so they have longer sustain, but when you compress them and they're in a mix, often the body or sustain of the drum shell can often uh, disappear or get gold up. And this is why we use what we call the parallel compression. The idea of parallel compression is to squash the initial transient and then have a really quick release on the compressor, which will then bring up the volume of the sustain. You mix that in under the original recording and you get your nice big transient from the original recording and then the sustain from the parallel compression. So, you've got a snare drum. Snare. And then bus wise, you're gonna have, you don't have to have a drum bus, but I do, so I'm gonna put a drum bus in here. And then you also have paracomp. Parallel compression. So, you've got your snare drum in your door. You're obviously gonna put that into your drum bus. That's a given. But we wanna get that sustain from the parallel compression, right? So on a separate bus, put a little circle around these, uh, you're gonna send the snare to your bus. So you're gonna send that snare to the paracomp, and then you want the paracomp to go back into the drum bus. So then you send the paracomp to the drum bus. So now we've got the original recording of the snare, which you might have compressed and etc. onto it, which is nice and transient -y and punchy and poppy, to the drum bus. But then we want that sustain to come up from the uh, parallel compression. So we feed the snare to the parallel compression and we get the signal and sustain that we're looking for. And then send the parallel compression to the drum bus for the final sound. Next question. This is from Jason Turnbull. Apart from drums, what other instruments have you gotten cool results with using smash and grab and what drum setting were you using for each one and why? For example, why use the snare setting on guitar or bass instead of kick or rooms? Um, good question, Jason. Okay. So you can approach this two different ways. You can either think about what kind of normal compressor settings that we might have applied to the different uh, compression drum types. So for example, for the parallel, as we were just saying, you're gonna have a fast attack and fast release setting. For a snare, you might have a slower attack and a sort of medium release. For overheads, it's gonna be a, a more subtle compression setting because we don't want it to be pumping too hard. So having that sort of basic knowledge uh, can be useful in knowing when to apply it to a different uh, source. I personally try not to think about stuff too hard and just flip through stuff until I like something that sounds good. I'm trying to think, I've used the snare setting on like a pop guitar before because I wanted like a nice spanky uh, sort of drivey strat tone and the snare setting worked really really well for that because as I said it's got a slower attack and but then uh, released uh, in time for the next strum or uh, input into the compressor. So I would just advise using your ears. It's a bit of a boring uh, answer but it's kind of the truth. And next from Joey Vaughan, Vaughan, Joey Vaughan, Joey Vaughan. How to properly pan out drums, which kit pieces should be rendered to mono and stereo and the sound differences between large and small diaphragm mics? Uh, panning drums, just do it, listen to your favorite record, see how they pan it and then copy that. There are like two main different ways of panning drums, which is audience perspective or drama perspective. I'm a drummer, so I can't stand audience perspective because I like to drum along to records 
So for me, if it's done audio perspective, my hi-hat will be on the right hand side and then my ride on the left and it will all be backwards and I'll feel like a left-handed drummer. So I personally like audience, uh, I personally like drummer perspective. Which kit pieces should be rendered to mono and stereo? Uh, in contact, I recommend that you output everything as stereo. The routing can get a little bit complicated if you like to mix mono and stereo and with all your digital plugins and stuff, they can all handle stereo inputs. So I would just advise routing everything out as stereo. Simpler, it's more reliable, it's quicker, just do it that way. Next question from Mira Ali. How do you augment live drums through the GGD Halpern's kit room mics? Can this be done with the other GGD libraries too? I saw somewhere that you can do this with the Halpern kit at least, but never found out how. So, there are different ways you can do this. Uh, you can do it with any of the libraries um, that we offer. You can either use a program like Slate Trigger or um, your DAWs will have a audio to MIDI function also, which will then turn the drum stems into MIDI, which you can then trigger our libraries with. The other way, is we provide TCI files with all of our libraries. Uh, this is to use in a program called Slate Trigger 2.0, in which you put a live drum stem into it and it goes through and triggers uh, replacement samples of your choosing. So for instance, if you want to trigger room microphones to simulate a drum room, just put all your stems through Slate Trigger and select the room microphones from our libraries to trigger when the drum stems uh, make them and this will basically simulate a live drum room effect. I've actually got a video on our YouTube showing you how to do this. It's called How to Convert Drum Stems to MIDI. So go check that out for a more detailed explanation. Rick Massey Music. I'd love to see a quick sample of remapping MIDI to work with a MIDI file that was originally programmed in another drum program. Okay, let's head over to my computer. I'll just make a very simple, simple beat and do it on all the wrong keys. So let's have my hi-hat up here. Let's put the kick on the flam, why not? There. Right, so obviously at the moment this sounds like this. Let's get rid of that. That's not what we want. So if I'm gonna do it this way, well, the first easiest way to do it is literally just drag the MIDI notes to the drums that you want. So that to kick. That to snare, that to hi-hat. But I'll show you the other way, is to go into the mapping section of our libraries. Where is it? Here we are, mappings. And change these to the corresponding notes. So our kick is on D sharp zero. So let's go into here, click here, D sharp zero. This will now trigger the kick. And there we go. Alternatively, it might be worth heading into our Facebook forum and seeing if anyone can just give you a MIDI mapping file to match the program which you are importing MIDI from. Next question. Zach Munowitz. Munowitz? I should know that. Best way to add invasion symbols to modern and massive. I also made a video on this on our YouTube. Load up an instance each of the libraries in contact, so one version of Invasion, one version of Modern and Massive in the same instance of contact. Um, turn both to read the MIDI channel Omni, and then you simply just map symbols to the keys that you want them on, and it's going to read, both libraries are reading the same MIDI channel, so it's, it's going to be triggering samples from both libraries. Next question. Peter Hansen, techniques for getting kick and bass to really lock with one another. This comes from the low end information and making sure they're sitting well with one another. Um, people say don't mix with your eyes. I say heck the guys and do what you want. Programs like FabFilter Q3 have really good analytics uh, visuals to show you where frequencies are overlapping. Um, so say if you want them to be both in their own little space but then gelling well together, you might have the kick fundamental or the sub bass of the kick uh, peaking at say like 60 hertz and then so what I would do is I'd go into the bass and notch out a little bit of 60 hertz and then say boost 80 hertz so they've got two little boosts next to each other but they're not overlapping and crowding each other out. Uh, you then go into the kick and maybe notch out a little bit of the 80 hertz. Next question! I'd love to see some step-by-step -step or pointers on getting the Halpern kit to sound more punchy using Logic stock plugins. 
We have a series of videos of stock plugin mixing tutorials that Misha, Des, and Nolly did. Nolly did one in Logic. Uh, admittedly, it was using the Modern and Massive kit, but the same techniques and uh, plugins and signal chains will work for Halpern too. So go check that out. Next question. Lawrence Ames. Maybe mention that every articulation can be gain adjusted. This is a great little feature in our libraries. I actually made a post about it uh, last week, I think, or this week. Um, in the mappings page, I'll go and show you. This little trim channel here, this allows you to individually change the volume of each individual articulation individually. Can you believe it, individual? And then to get it low, this can be really useful for uh, specific articulations that you can't adjust with like a cymbal fader or something. So say if you want the hi-hat chicks to be a little bit louder. Obviously one way you could do this is just to move up the hi-hat fader, but then that's going to make all the stick hits on the hi-hat really loud too, which may be too loud. So then just go into that uh, mappings tab and trim up the hi-hat chicks and then it's fixed. Next question. Eric. 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 Everson, I'm very sorry. Tutorial for realistic hi-hat dynamics. I have a video on our YouTube called Realistic Snare Fills and that same knowledge can be uh, crossed over and applied to hi-hat dynamics. My number one tip for realistic dynamics when programming MIDI is to think about how a drummer moves. Study drum videos. Look at teachers showing rudiments on a practice pad. This is, that's a really good one actually because you're gonna see how drummers move their hands and accent certain things and how they use dynamics uh, in single stroke rolls to create nice movement. Or if they're doing a double stroke, you can see and hear which of the two hits of each hand is louder and which is quieter. And those are the kind of things that when applied to programming MIDI really make a difference and turn the MIDI from sounding from a drum machine to actually just a drummer playing. That's the key. Um, yeah, that's all the questions I have. I will no doubtedly, no doubt, no, I will, with, without, no doubt, I, I will make another one soon, I'm sure. So, in the meantime, uh, head over to our forum, our YouTube, our Instagram. We've recently started uploading all our long-form Instagram clips to Instagram TV. Um, yeah, we love you guys. See you next time.